All right, this is for topic 3.1a for Computer Science 9618, taking a look at primary, secondary, storage, and embedded system, as well as some RAM. So let's go ahead and take a look at our learning targets for today. Candidates should be able to show understanding of the need for input, output, primary memory, and secondary, including removable storage, and show understanding of embedded systems, and that means the benefits and drawbacks of embedded systems. So let's jump right in. So why do we need input and output? Well, input devices are needed to input information or to represent information in such a way where calculations can be done or the data can be recorded or manipulated. Output devices allow us to visually see, hear, or interpret digital data. When you're trying to figure out if it's an input or output device, think about the various components and ask yourself, does this allow input of data or does it show me the output? So simply asking that question can help you figure out if it's an input device or output device. And it's very uh, easy to understand why we need both. So let's move on to primary storage. Now computers have primary storage and most people think that's the hard drive. It is not the hard drive. Primary storage is the RAM, which stands for Random Access Memory, and the ROM, which is Read Only Memory, and we'll be talking about both today. Now, all computer systems come with RAM, and don't be misled by the random. It refers to any memory location that can be used regardless of which memory location was previously used. This means if address 2300 was used, it's not going to be address 2301 that is going to be used next. It's any space on the RAM, regardless of which location was previously used. Now, accessing information on RAM is much faster than accessing the information on a hard drive, which is our secondary storage. Now, RAM can be written to or read from, and the data stored can be changed by the user or computer when we manipulate our data. It's used to store data, files, part of an application, or part of the operating system that is currently in use, and the RAM is what we call volatile. And that means when the power goes out or you shut down your computer, you lose the memory contents that are currently on your primary storage or on the RAM. Primary storage and RAM are the same uh, thing. So you lose the power, you lose the contents. It's called volatile. That is what that word means. So RAM technically never becomes 100% full. Well, if that's the case, why does the computer run slower and slower if we have RAM to spare? Well, as the RAM becomes more full, not 100% full, but more full. Your secondary storage, your hard drive, is accessed by the processor. Old data on the RAM is going to be written to the secondary memory, while new data will be written to the RAM. Now, increasing the size of your primary storage will make the computer operate more quickly, and there are two types of RAM you need to be familiar with. Cambridge wants you to know dynamic random access memory called DRAM and static random access memory called SRAM. So let's start with dynamic random access memory. It has transistors and capacitors. Each of these are tiny since a RAM chip will contain millions of transistors and capacitors. The capacitors hold the bits, zeros and ones, while the transistors act like switches that read the capacitor or change the value of the capacitor. So when we're manipulating data, we're changing those zeros and ones. Now, the downfall to DRAM is that it needs to be refreshed. This is why it's dynamic, it's always changing. Every 15 microseconds, the capacitor needs to be recharged. It's like a leaky bucket that constantly needs to be refilled. Well, if it's recharging every 15 microseconds, that means more power is going to be used. The benefit though, is a, it's a lot less expensive than SRAM. Now it does use more power than SRAM, that's the drawback, but there is one more benefit. Not only is it less expensive, it also has higher memory capacity than SRAM. But we said, it's like a leaky bucket. All the contents are constantly leaking out and we just gotta keep refilling it. Well, that's gonna cause more power. So when you're talking about DRAM, Sure, it's less expensive, has high memory capacity, but God, is it going to pull power just constantly, constantly uh, leaking that information. And it's got to be uh, recharged. All right, so let's jump into SRAM, static random access memory. Well, with all those benefits of DRAM, why would anyone use SRAM? Well, a major difference is SRAM does not need to be refreshed. 
This means it's going to uh, use less power. Yeah, but is that the only benefit? And no, SRAM is also faster and is used where speed is essential. It can typically, typically access data in 25 nanoseconds, where DRAM takes about 60 nanoseconds. So SRAM is about twice as fast as a DRAM. Now, processor memory uh, is, is cache, uses the uh, SRAM, and instead of transistors and capacitors, it uses flip-flop. So SRAM is more expensive, while DRAM is uh, less expensive. And I found this chart here. I thought this was a great chart. Uh, it has uh, split up uh, static RAM and dynamic RAM, where you can easily compare and uh, contrast them. So everything we just went over is uh, right here. Like SRAMs are used in cache memory. DRAM is used in main memory, which is uh, the RAM. So you can uh, take a look at this and quickly review if you uh, need to. So you may be asking yourself, well, SRAM, DRAM, what am I using? What do I have? Well, since right around 2015, most computers employ both. DRAM is used with holding data such as programs and changes to your programs. SRAM is used with the processor holding temporary storage of frequently used data. Now, you typically have more DRAM than SRAM in your computer. Now, what about that other type of main memory I mentioned at the beginning? What about that ROM, the read-only memory? Now, it can only be read cannot be written to or changed. There are some exceptions uh, to that rule, and we'll be going over them in just a minute. Now, ROM is non-volatile. You lose power, no big deal. The contents are still there. Now, these are permanent memory devices. There are exceptions to that rule, which we'll go over in just a minute. Now, its purpose is to store data that the computer needs to start up. When you turn on your computer, the ROM is being read from, which tells the operating system how to boot up. Now, we do have what's called PROM. It is programmable read-only memory. Now, this can be changed once. So it's not really permanent memory devices because it can be changed one time. So it does that by burning fuses into a matrix. And these are used in your mobile phone and uh, RFID tags. So like you go to, uh, you buy something off the shelf. It has an RFID tag. It may go off uh, if it hasn't been removed, saying you're trying to steal an item. You also have EEPROM, uh, so we have read-only memory, and you know we're saying it's permanent, but this is an exception to the rule. It's erasable, programmable, read-only memory. It's programmed by using UV light through a quartz window, used in applications under current development, such as new gaming consoles, but it's erasable, so it's not really permanent because you can erase it. And then we have electronically erasable uh, Programmable read-only memory used by solid-state devices and relies on NOR chips rather than NAND chips. They're faster, but they are more expensive. Now, the data can be erased in single bytes at a time, whereas NAND whole blocks must be erased or read. And that is why, the um, by using NOR chips, that it uh, runs faster. All right, let's jump into secondary storage. Now, these are not directly accessed by the CPU, and these devices are non-volatile. Storage is much larger than RAM, but it runs so much slower. All your applications, the operating system, the drivers, the devices, the files, everything is stored on your secondary storage, which is your hard drive. Now, there are three types of secondary storage. There is magnetic, there is solid state, there's optical, and we're gonna be covering those in a future lesson, because we can do a whole presentation uh, just on those. We don't like, I don't like to make these videos super long, so we'll be doing a whole uh, future presentation on that. Now, it's very important to note that an external hard drive, could be magnetic or solid state, is used for storing files. A common misconception that it's only to backup files. You don't have to use an external hard drive to back up just the backup files. You can use it to store files. For example, you buy an external hard drive for your uh, video gaming console. You can store games on there rather than just backing up games that you have. Now, external hard drive or flash drive, which it uses flash memory, is an example of a removable memory. It's removable because it can easily be removed. So pretty uh, good there. All right, let's do the last topic, embedded systems. So a microprocessor is installed into a device to make it be controlled in a more efficient way. Ovens, 
your refrigerator, even thermostats can now be controlled by cell phones or, or another web-enabled device. Shutting off the AC can be done with an app from anywhere in the world. Now, there are both and cons of an embedded system. The embedded system allows us to control it from our phone. So if you're, if you're asking like, well, how does a phone work with that? It, it accesses and controls the embedded system because we're able to access it from anywhere in the world. So let's go over the pros, then we'll go over the cons, and then we'll be done. So the pros, it can easily fit into devices because they're so small and they're so cheap to make. It doesn't require an operating system, and they're usually simplistic, dealing with one task. They operate in real time, which means it reacts fast and consumes very little power. They're mass produced, which means they are reliable. And because they're mass produced, they're cheap to make. All right, let's go over the cons. When new technology comes available, it's hard to upgrade the devices. When it's working, a specialist is usually required to help. That's the downside. You got to call somebody out. They're going to charge you, you know, a fee to come out. Then they're going to charge you to replace the parts. It can get expensive very quickly. Now, the interface may be simple, but something like changing the time on a stove, that can require several steps. I didn't say it was hard. So if you're like, oh my goodness, it's not that hard. You're right but it requires several steps. And we're thinking from an embedded system point of view, not from humans being lazy uh, point of view. So if you're like, oh my God, it's not that big of a deal. You're right, but that is a con of the embedded system. It takes several steps. Now, any device on the internet is open to hackers, viruses, and so on. And because upgrading and finding out what is wrong with your device, most people just throw them away, which is wasteful. Uh, finding out what is wrong with your device, having to upgrade it, people just throw it away. They're like, I don't want to deal with that. It's wasteful. Well, if it's not working, better get a new one. That's how everybody deals with that. All right, so that's going to be it for this podcast. Hope you found it helpful. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe. Leave a comment below if you have any suggestions, and we'll see you guys in the next one.